On January 17th, the Supreme Court heard oral arguments in Loper, Bright Enterprises versus Raimondo, and Relentless versus Department of Commerce. Those are two cases which asked the court to overrule the landmark Chevron case. Hello, friends. I'm Jeffrey Rosen, president and CEO of the National Constitution Center, and welcome to We the People, a weekly show of constitutional debate. The National Constitution Center is a nonpartisan nonprofit chartered by Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the Constitution among the American people. In this episode, we'll break down arguments in Loper and Relentless and explore the future of Chevron and the administrative state. Joining me to answer these questions are two leading experts on the case and on administrative law. Christopher Walker is a professor of law at Michigan Law School. He's the author of many books on administrative law, including the forthcoming Constraining Bureaucracy Beyond Judicial Review, Rethinking Administrative Law in a System Without Courts. He's filed a brief in support of neither party for these cases. Chris, it is wonderful to welcome you to We the People. Great to be here. And Tim Sandifer is Vice President for Legal Affairs at the Goldwater Institute's Scharf Norton Center for Constitutional Litigation, and he holds the Duncan Chair in Constitutional Government. He's also an adjunct scholar with the Cato Institute. He's the author of eight books, including most recently, Freedoms, Furies, How Isabel Patterson, Rose Wilder Lane, and Ayn Rand Found Liberty in an Age of Darkness. He's filed a brief in support of the petitioners. Tim, great to welcome you back to We the People. Thanks for having me back. Chris, you argue that Chevron should be affirmed. Tell us what Chevron is and why you think it should be affirmed. Chevron is a decision of the Supreme Court uh, from 1984 uh, that recognized uh, kind of, the, in my mind, the, the bedrock principle of administrative law today, that agencies are the primary implementers of the statutes that Congress charges them to implement. Uh, and so the court, it was a unanimous court. This was the beginning of the Reagan administration. The Reagan administration's EPA had change its position in a regulation to make it more business friendly under the Clean Air Act. Uh, and the Supreme Court said you could do that, uh, that when there's a new administration or whenever an agency sees there's change policy rationales or facts on the ground, uh, they have the flexibility to change how they interpret that law. And in particular, we have from the Chevron decision this famous kind of two-step uh, approach where the court says the first question a reviewing court has to look at is whether the statutory provision at issue uh, that the agency is administering is ambiguous. Uh, if it's unambiguous, the court declares what it is and we're done. <laughs> if it's ambiguous, uh, then the court defers to the agency's interpretation so long as it's reasonable. Uh, and Justice Stevens, writing for the court in Chevron, kind of made three main arguments for why we have it. The first is congressional delegation, that when Congress leaves an ambiguity in a statute, uh, that an agency administers, it wants the agency and not the court to be the first and primary interpreter. Uh, and the reason why they do that, just as Stevens said, is because agencies have more expertise on their statutory scheme and on the subject matter that they regulate than a general's court. Uh, and also that uh, agencies are more politically accountable uh, than an unelected judiciary uh, because the president ultimately has quite a bit of control over what agencies do. And of course, Congress can come back through oversight appropriations and additional legislation to rein in what an agency does on the ground. And so for those reasons, the court said, this is a, a tool uh, that courts should use to respect uh, judgments that agency make when it comes to the statutes they administer. Thank you very much for that and for introducing the case so well. Tim, uh, tell us what Chevron is and why you think it should be overturned. Well, so Chevron started out as this idea of trying to minimize uh, the the discretion of judges to implement their own policy preferences as uh, in the form of legal interpretation, which I think everybody agrees is not an appropriate thing for courts to do. The problem is that 40 years of experience with Chevron has proven what really ought to have been obvious from the beginning, which is that by ordering courts to defer to these administrative bureaucracies, what you do is you, in, you basically remove the important checks and balances that prevent those bureaucracies from expanding their own power and taking advantage of broad language and statutes. 
to uh, to to grow themselves. And and let me begin by by saying this is not a knock against administrative officials or bureaucrats themselves. In fact, it's conscientious bureaucrats. It's hardworking honorable bureaucrats who are most to be feared in this context because they are the ones who are going to strive the hardest to expand and uh, the bureaucratic power and to enforce it to the to the utmost and so by removing judicial oversight the way chevron does by telling courts that they have to defer to these agencies you create a system where these bureau- bureaucracies can read the statutes that give them power in in the most expansive way possible and they are likely to do so. And then that, of course, creates an additional danger, which is that it creates an incentive for Congress to pass very broadly worded statutes in order to sort of uh, 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 shuffle off democratic accountability and responsibility so that they can maximize, so that Congress members can maximize their credit for the good things and minimize their blame for the bad things. And, and not have to actually take on the hard responsibility of governing. A good example of that is the statute at issue in the Loper Bright case itself, which gives the agency in question power to, quote, prescribe such other measures or conditions or requirements as are determined to be necessary and appropriate, end quote. Now, how broad is that, right? That is a blank check on government power. And then Chevron tells the courts that when the bureaucracy goes ahead and writes whatever rules it deems to be necessary and appropriate, the court has to just, you know, bow and say, yes, sir, yes, sir. And I think that has proven itself to be a real problem over the past 40 years as bureaucracies have expanded their power and accountability has been minimized. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Let's now step back and explore the history of judicial deference in administrative cases. Uh, Chris Walker, the decision that Chevron overturned on the lower court was written by then-Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who told me in later years that there was nothing inherently liberal or conservative about judicial deference. Uh, In this case, there's a dispute about whether or not the original understanding of the Constitution requires strict construction of executive actions or not, and there's also a dispute about whether the Administrative Procedure Act requires judicial deference to executive agencies. Tell us about that history and and whether or not you think that judicial deference to agencies is consistent with the original understanding of the Constitution. Yeah, I mean, so I would just say at at the outset, um, the court is gonna have to really, like the hard question here is, is Chevron deference consistent with the Administrative Procedure Act that was enacted in, in 1946? And I think that's where some of the most interesting scholarship has been done, kind of a deeper dive. Um, all of the scholars I'm aware of recognize that some form of deference existed before the Administrative Procedure Act in 1946. Um, and I think most also would agree it's not our Chevron two-step, that that's like a much more crystallized, kind of maybe a more robust rule-like deference. Uh, But when you think about what what Congress was trying to do when they enacted the Administrative Procedure Act, which is like the quasi-constitution of the administrative state, um, that it was trying to codify the existing common law backdrop, the the norms and rules uh, the courts had created when it comes to deference. And so if you take like, I think those that that, that have argued that Chevron's not consistent with the Administrative Procedure Act. Their argument, someone like Aditya Banzai or John Duffy, both professors at the University of Virginia, they argue that if you look at those earlier cases, most, uh, if not all, I would say most, because there are a couple that don't quite fit, um, say that courts should defer to agency interpretations that are contemporaneous uh, and consistent. Uh, In other words, if they were done at the time the statute was enacted or if they were consistent over time, uh, that that gets deference. So, of course, that's a lot weaker deference than Chevron. Chevron itself was a case where the EPA changed its interpretation uh, from the Carter administration EPA's approach. Uh, so that's kind of the debate you have on the statutory side. And I candidly really think it's a really hard question. But ultimately, for me, this is about stare decisis and, and keeping in place uh, a rule that has existed for over 40 years been cited you know, thousands of times in the lower courts. Um, but that, but I do think that's the big debate. I think that's the hard debate uh, along those lines. Now, there are also constitutional arguments that have been raised uh, against uh, Chevron, 
And candidly, I just don't think they're very good. And I'm sure Tim might disagree with me a little bit, <laughs> maybe a lot. But so that when I think of the constitutional arguments, there are kind of two different flavors. The first argument is an Article One argument. Um, at least that's what you know I call it. And, and because it's Article One of the Constitution that gives Congress the power to legislate. And the argument goes that Chevron deference encourages uh, Congress to overdelegate to agencies for some of the reasons that Tim said. Um, they have incentives. They can give a lot of power to agencies. If they don't like what they're doing, they can reach out and pressure them to do something different through oversight, through committee work, through appropriations. Uh, and then they can take the credit for the good stuff the agency does, as Tim mentioned, and blame the agency when something goes wrong. Um, I don't. I, I think this is a, a, a decent policy argument uh, that you know it's something we should think about. Does Chevron reward Congress for overdelegating? I think it's a pretty meritless constitutional argument, though. Um, if that's if what we're really worried about is Congress delegating something they can't delegate, uh, then we should be talking about the non-delegation doctrine uh, and reinvigorating that. And instead, if we're worried about as well, like this might give incentives for Congress to overdelegate, well, that's Congress's prerogative. As long as they're delegating as constitutional, uh, then that's that's really just fair game. Congress can decide how much it wants to give away within constitutional limits. So that's the uh, Article One uh, argument. The Article Three argument is the Article Three uh, is what gives the, the courts the power of the Constitution that says that the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in a, in the Supreme Court and lower courts as Congress so designs. And that argument is kind of your Marbury versus Madison. The Supreme Court has to say what the law is, and Chevron doesn't allow them to say what the law is. In other words, they can't say this is the best interpretation of the statute. If there are multiple reasonable interpretations, a court has to defer to an agency. And, you know, another way to think of this, this is Phil Hamburger's approach. He he's the runs the center that is the counsel for the relentless petitioner in this case. And he would say this is a due process violation. So another way to think of this is it puts the thumb on the scale for the government when they get into court. Uh, and on this one, again, I, I just don't think it works in the sense that Congress, if you look at Congress, can strip lower courts of jurisdiction entirely. Uh, since the founding, as uh, the Solicitor General mentioned yesterday, we've had habeas review, we've had mandamus review. All of those require a court to defer uh, to the government in one way or another, or to defer to the party that's not seeking you know, relief. Uh, and it would be a dramatic, dramatic change to our constitutional structure to say that de novo review of legal interpretations is required under the Constitution. In fact, I'd go so far to say, and I'm stealing this from Judge Easterbrook, you'd have to get rid of federal habeas review of state court convictions as well, because there Congress has commanded that federal courts defer to state court interpretations uh, along those lines. So I don't think either of those arguments work, the Article 1 or Article 3, although they do raise good policy points. The one point that I would flag is it gets more complicated with criminal law, and that's why Chevron doesn't apply to criminal law. And I think it also gets a little bit more complicated on the Article 3 front uh, with private rights, because um, you could imagine there'd be some issues there. But that's like way into the weeds. Vast majority of Chevron deference deals with public benefits and you know not, not private rights. Tim, lots to respond to, but I want to ask you about the framers and uh, deference. You say in your brief, judicial deference is inconsistent with our constitutional order. The framers had no theory of judicial restraint. They considered a vigilant, engaged judiciary indispensable to a successful constitution. Tell us more about your historical arguments that judicial deference was invented in the 20th century uh, by justices like Holmes and scholars like Thayer. And consider the the counter argument that, in fact, the debate about deference versus engagement goes back to the debate between Hamilton and Jefferson over the constitutionality of the bank and Hamilton's liberal construction embraced by Chief Justice Marshall is a theory of deference to national power and that the petitioners here are trying to resurrect a Jeffersonian efforts to constrain the powers of the federal government, a debate that goes back to the founding. Oh, man, it sounds better every time I hear it. Jeff, Jeff, you should know that all constitutional debates go back to Marbury versus Madison and the dis debate between Jefferson and, and Hamilton over everything. Uh, <laughs> the, the, it is absolutely the uh, I thought Professor Walker did a good job of, of referring to this Article one and Article three problem because it is 
uh, rooted in in this constitutional order that when it was when the constitution was written, it simply did not contemplate the administrative regulatory state that we have today, which is really an advent of the progressives in the 20th century and really exploded with the New Deal and Great Society eras. And so the Constitution makes no reference to any kind of deference theory at all. And in fact, it it arguably does just the opposite of that by creating three equally powerful branches of government for the purpose of checking and balancing each other. Deference is a form of disarmament, uh, unilateral disarmament by the courts that are supposed to be there to to ensure that the legislature stays within its bounds and that the the president stays within his bounds. And this is where the the courts step back and say, well, we're we're just going to let the other branches act. There's nothing in the Constitution that justifies that. And quite the opposite, in Federal 62, Madison has this, this marvelous passage where he says, it, I'm just paraphrasing here, he says it will be of little value to the people that the laws are made by people of their own choosing if the laws are so voluminous that they cannot be read or understood or if they change from one day to the next and therefore don't even really qualify as law. And that's, that's what happens with administrative law. The great philosopher Hannah Arendt described administrative law as unlike the rule of law, instead it was the rule of cleverness. And that's, that's the way administrative decrees operate. They're, they're not chosen by the people's elected representatives. They're the result of insulated bureaucrats who are often career bureaucrats, who are often members of government unions, so they can't even be fired, and who have every incentive to increase their power at the expense of the citizenry. The Constitution... By contrast, the Constitution anticipates that the courts are going to be the interpreters of the law. There's that famous famous passage in Marbury versus Madison when Marshall says it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is. And in that respect, with regard to that quote, there was a very revealing passage in the oral arguments about the in in these cases when Justice Ketanji Jackson said, are you saying, I'm paraphrasing again, she said, are you saying that every case of statutory ambiguity has to be reviewed by the courts? Like this was some sort of shocking, new, dramatic, radical new innovation, when of course that has always been the job of courts since for centuries before Marbury, it was the job of courts to interpret statutes. And of course they applied de novo review. This is not a hard, radical, dramatic, drastic suggestion. This is the ordinary process that the founding fathers were familiar with when they wrote the Constitution and created the judiciary. I, I don't, and I agree, you mentioned I, that uh, Justice Ginsburg said that this is ni- there's nothing inherently liberal or conservative about this. I want to emphasize that point. There is nothing li- inherently liberal or conservative about this. If there's anything that the previous administration should have taught my Democrat Party friends, it's that they should be just as leery of administrative power as any of my Republican friends are because it's these administrative agencies that enable the president to dr- drastically alter the legal landscape with a stroke of a pen. That's not the constitutional order that was contemplated by the framers of the Constitution or by any of the amendments. Nothing in the Constitution today contemplates anything like this. If the people want it, they should amend the Constitution to create this thing. But to, to create excuses for it, such as the judge-made doctrine of judicial deference, as a, as a means of reducing the constitutional barriers that limit government power, that seems very foolhardy. And not only does it seem that way, but it has been proven very foolhardy. In case after case of administrative agencies expanding their power, beyond reasonable uh, uh, limits. Uh, The example I give in the brief, actually, my favorite example that I give in my brief, which is actually a state law case under under a state equivalent to Chevron deference, is in California, where an administrative agency determined that bees, that is honeybees, qualify as fish under California's statute. And the state Supreme Court applying California's version of the Chevron deference said, yep, that's fine with us. I mean, now that's crazy. That's crazy. There's not a single Californian, not a single one of the 30 million people living in California think that bees are fish. And yet this administrative agency using the equivalent of Chevron says, eh, we, we want to expand our power. Bees are invertebrates. That qualifies, uh, that, that it's included within the definition. There you go. And the courts say, eh, we're going to blind ourselves to that. I mean, that's the problem with, with these deference doctrines is we're, we are, we, as, we the people are entitled to an independent judiciary that acts as a check and balance against the other branches. And we're being deprived of that under the court-made 
non-constitutional doctrines of deference that govern today. Chris, let's turn to the question of stare decisis, which you address in your brief. You say, as to Chevron, the pull of statutory stare decisis is too strong to overcome. Over the last four decades, this court has repeatedly reaffirmed Chevron, and the federal courts have relied on it in thousands of cases. Tell us why you think stare decisis is so strong. And of course, this is a debate that's on the court, uh, very vibrant right now. Uh, is there a chance, do you think, that uh, the court might be more persuaded by the stare decisis argument in considering Chevron than they were in, in, in the Dobbs case overruling Roe v. Wade? Yeah. So when we talk about stare decisis when it comes to Chevron, this is a statutory interpretation. You know, it is a bedrock view of what the Administrative Procedure Act means. And so we're not in a world of constitutional stare decisis that someone like Justice Thomas like doesn't believe in. <laughs> you know, we're in a world that even Justice Thomas thinks that stare decisis matters. And the reason why is because if the court got it wrong, um, Congress can fix it. Um, you know, if Congress doesn't want Chevron, tomorrow they could pass legislation. In fact, some Republicans have had legislation on this for over a decade called the Separation of Powers Restoration Act that's never made it anywhere in the Senate, although it's come out of the House a couple of times. Um, and, and, and so... We're not in a world where like, Congress can't legislate to overrule um, Roe v. Wade or another constitutional precedent. And so the separation of powers concerns are at their height when it comes to a court deciding whether to get rid of a precedent that Congress can, can change itself. Um, and in fact, if you look at all the kind of the empirical work that's been done, um, Lisa Bressman, Abby Glutz, study of congressional staffers, what does Congress use? What tools of interpretation they use when they draft statutes? The number one tool is Chevron. Um, they think about Chevron when they draft statutes. Uh, and what they say is that when we draft statutes that deal with agencies, our primary audience isn't the court, it's the agency. Our dialogue is trying to tell the faithful agents at in the bureaucracy <laughs> what, what Congress wants them to do to fill in the details in the statutes they're charged to administer. Uh, and so you have this, and in fact, Kent Barnett's got this great article at Professor at the University of Georgia, um, that where it shows that Congress has even codified Chevron and departed from Chevron uh, in Dodd-Frank and in other places, where it said, you know what, we actually don't want Chevron deference in this particular context. There it was preemption decisions by the Office of the Control of the Currency. Uh, and so Congress knows what Chevron is since 1984. It's legislated against the backdrop of Chevron when it's reauthorized the hundreds of statutes that govern federal agencies. And so it'd be a really dramatic move for the court to change this on their own. Beyond that, federal agencies rely heavily on Chevron when they draft regulation. Courts have you know, cited it thousands of times. Ken Burnett and I spent three years reading every Chevron decision over an 11-year period. And not just that, the regulated public has uh, internalized those costs and relied on that when they when they structure their affairs. And so it would be a dramatic, dramatic change for the court to get rid of something uh, in this context. Um, I do want to respond a little bit to Tim. I, I think Justice Kagan's questions and oral argument really capture what's, what, what's at stake here, uh, which is that it's statutes that govern federal agencies are highly complex. They can't anticipate every single thing that a, a regulator is going to run across uh, when they're trying to implement a statute. So necessarily, there's always going to be ambiguities, implementation details in a statute uh, that someone has to fill in. Uh, when Kent Barnett and I were reading these, you know, 1,500 cases, a lot of this is like, what's a reasonable risk assessment? Or what is the best system of emissions? Or what is, like, these are not like terms that a court's going to say, aha, there's one answer to this. They're terms that are really, really, you know, scientific or expert driven. Uh, and an agency is going to be a much, much more equipped to deal with that. Uh, and, and, and so I think that's kind of the, you know, Tim can point to a few really bad cases. I haven't read the one that he mentioned from California. My guess is that was just wrongly decided <laughs> under the California deference doctrine. Um, but the run of the mill case where Chevron applies uh, is about giving the agency the leeway. Uh, to apply their expertise that a general's court just doesn't have. And that's not a new concept. I mean, that's something that has been around since the founding, where the executive branch has to make judgment calls about how to implement a statute. Tim, Chris has raised two big points. First, that 
respect for precedent should be higher in statutory and constitutional cases because Congress can overturn the court if it disagrees. And he also notes that Justice Barrett has written extensively on this subject as a professor. Uh, so response to that, do you think that Justice Barrett and, and other justices might be more sympathetic to the precedent argument here than they were in Dobbs? And then maybe take up his uh, second argument that, as Justice Kagan argued at oral argument, agencies are better equipped than courts to fill in ambiguous statutory language. Well, I do think that stare decisis concerns are going to weigh heavily on the court's mind. And I think that's why, if you listen to the argument, there's so much discussion over how much the courts actually apply Chevron in the first place. They talk a lot about, do they really even apply this? You know, and, and there's a lot of back and forth about how many cases this, this theory actually applies to. And that's because they're trying to address the concern about whether or not this would be a drastic change. Now, I, I count myself among those like Justice Thomas who I'm much less concerned about stare decisis than I am about getting the law right. And it seems to me that there's there's no better time to do the right thing than now, and there's no better reason for overturning a legal precedent than the fact that it was wrongly decided and Chevron was wrongly decided. So I'm not particularly concerned about the reliance interests, especially because the reliance interests we're talking about here are reliance interests by the government. Now, of course, the government is always going to want to rely on a doctrine that gives it more power. That's just the nature of human beings. And that's why, to quote Justice Gorsuch from the argument the other day, uh, the government always wins under Chevron. The government always wins. And because of that, you are naturally going to find Congress taking advantage and relying on Chevron when drafting these statutes. I'll quote again from the statute that's issue in, at issue in this case. The agency can, quote, prescribe such other measures or conditions or requirements as are determined to be necessary and appropriate, end quote. In other words, do what you like, bureaucrats. Now, the, sh the Congress is going to love a, 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 a deference doctrine from the courts that allows them to do that and to wash their hands of this, of whatever problem is at issue, and go home to their constituents and say, look, I solved this problem because I created the, I created this, this no bad things agency, and I passed this no bad things act that prohibits any bad things by creating a bad things agency that will go and de define the term bad thing, investigate potential bad things, and penalize people for doing bad things in violation, of course, of the principle of separation of powers, not to mention due process. So, of course, Congress is going to like this doctrine. Of course, they're going to rely on it when drafting statutes. And, of course, the agencies are going to rely on this doctrine, and they're going to love this doctrine. And, of course, the president's going to love this doctrine because it maximizes the president's power. And so, of course, they're going to rely on it. The question here is, what about the citizen? What about the individual who is entitled to a uh, an impartial judicial system that will protect his or her individual rights against government power. As far as Justice Kagan's point about the you know, technical applications of statutes, I, this strikes me as really just an excuse, just an excuse for the fact that Congress passes vague statutes that say things like reasonable, which nobody knows what these terms mean. And they, what they mean, of course, what that happens is that that means whatever the government says it means. That's what, that's what a vague statute means. It means whatever the government says it means. And I'm not in the government. I'm an ordinary citizen, so I'm against that. I, I, that strikes me as a really bad idea to, to say that we're going to maximize the opportunities and the, the potential uh, benefits to government officials to pass broadly worded vague statutes that act as blank checks and then, and then have the courts tie their own hands and refuse to act against that. And we've been living under a regime like that for decades now. And unsurprisingly, we have seen these agencies doing wild and crazy things, defining perfectly dry land as being a wetland, for example. And, and, and I think this is a point, by the way, that, that um, came up during Paul Clement's oral argument in a very effective way when he was saying, you know, one of the downsides is, is it creates gridlock. It means that Congress does not get around to addressing the major problems, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, whether you're liberal or conservative, these problems don't get resolved by congressional debate because every incentive is in place for Congress to, you know, talk in a bunch of vague sound bites and then leave all the power to the bureaucrats who, of course, are maximally insulated against the control of the voters. That's why they were created. That's why these agencies were created. The progressives created these agencies out of the express hope of separating government power from government accountability, from trying to get politics out of government and hand politics over to, or having government over to these experts 
who are you know so-called experts. I use scare quotes around the word experts because they purport to know how we, you and I, should live our lives, and 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 do that through these regulations that you know ought to be subject to challenge in court. And and how do they interpret a statute? How do, how does a regulated a, a bureaucrat at a regulatory agency interpret a statute? They do it the same way you and I do. They do it the same way that the that courts do. They apply the ordinary rules of what does reasonableness mean, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, they're not going into some sort of um, machine shop and doing high-tech quantum physics to figure out these words. If they could do that, then we should give those quantum physics machines to the judges so that they can use those machines. It, instead, what they're doing is they're applying the same kind of rational, logical arguments that you and I would apply. Well, there's no reason that the courts can't do that. They do it all the time. And this point came out during the oral argument when uh, Mr. Martinez said, imagine that the statute were challenged before the agency had acted in the first place. What would, ha- what would that happen then? Th- the court would have to apply the ordinary tools of statutory construction. And even Justice Kagan conceded that that was true. She said, yes, I guess that's, that, that's what the court would have to do. Well, then that shows that the courts can do it. There's no reason to hand over a government that is supposed to be of, by, and for the people to a bunch of so-called experts who are not accountable to the voters. Let's talk about the questions at oral argument about how disruptive overturning Chevron would be. Justice Barrett asked uh, Paul Clement uh, whether litigants would be lining up for cases decided under step two to reopen challenges to agency interpretation. By contrast, Justice Kavanaugh said, uh, the reality of how this works is Chevron itself ushers in shocks to the system every four years when there's a new administration. That's not stability. That's at war with reliance. Uh, Chris, what did you think of the responses to the justices' questions about disruption and whether or not you found them persuasive? Yeah, the um, I, thought, I found both persuasive, <laughs> which might actually seem kind of internally inconsistent. But, you know, when it comes to Chevron, I think one reason, and I think it was Justice Alito who asked, why have conservatives soured on Chevron? And I do think one of the reasons uh, that is that, you know, the way that it works now is with Congress not revisiting statutes that govern federal agencies on a regular basis, uh, and with them not kind of jumping to the challenge to to work with the president to implement election mandates, and I think Tim's already mentioned this, presidents have gone it alone more. Uh, I mean, we they've always gone it alone, but I think from the second term of the Obama administration through the Trump administration, definitely the Biden administration, when they can't get something through Congress, they go to the agencies and ask for, you know, to really stretch the statutory mandate to do something through regulation. And so you might say, at least the way I kind of think of it is, when Chevron was created in the 80s, we were thinking about 10 to 30 degree shifts in policy when there was a new president. And that's what Chevron allowed. Today, we're looking at, you know, 90 degree changes in policy, 180 degree changes in policy. I mean, immigration is a classic example. Again, I'm not just talking about Chevron. I'm talking more generally about how presidents use the administrative state to implement policy they can't get through Congress. And so I do think that Justice Kavanaugh is, is right, that it is troubling that you can have reversals of policy, like straight up reversals, uh, without Congress playing playing any direct role in that. Of course, Congress can still, through appropriations and oversight and through reining in who the president can appoint to run the agency, they can have some control. But I, th- I think that is an issue. Um, and, and I love the line in oral argument where um, Justice Barrett was asking about Brand X and Paul Clement says, I can't remember the exact quote, but like this was like the worst decision of all time. And Justice Barrett laughs. It's like, sorry, Justice Thomas, because Justice Thomas is the majority. Uh, wrote the majority in Brand X. And Brand X was a case that said, even if a court has interpreted a statute, an ambiguous statute to say this is the best interpretation of the statute, an agency can still come back and wipe out that judicial interpretation. And so I, I, I think that, that is problematic as a policy matter, absolutely, that we're using agencies to make really dramatic changes in policy when, when Congress really should make those value judgments. On the flip side, and Kent Barnett and I've done, and with Christina Boyd, a political scientist at the University of Georgia, you know, in reading these 1,500 cases in the lower courts, it turns out that Chevron's a powerful tool to create national uniformity in law. When you have one agency that declares what the law means, 
um, the, and the lower courts are deferring to that agency's interpretation, you're more likely to have one interpretation that a company or an individual can rely on when they live in California or New York uh, or Hawaii. And that's like a, a really important value for a business or for how we structure our society, that there's uniformity in the law. And when you don't have Chevron, you have a ton less uniformity. And similarly, it's a kind of a parallel to that argument. It turns out that judges are less political when you have Chevron. Uh, the most conservative judges are more likely to agree with the most liberal judges in the lower courts under Chevron than when you don't have Chevron. So I do think in a world without Chevron, uh, you're going to see a lot more politics and judging in the lower courts and a lot less uniformity in law. But I do concede that you might have not less predictability because agencies are going to be more conservative, more cautious. Uh, they're not going to try to push the pocket as much when they know they're not going to get deference. And litigants, I completely agree with Justice Barrett, are going to be running to the courthouse to relitigate uh, the interpretations that they lost on 5, 10, 15 years ago uh, now that they know that Chevron no longer applies. So we will have a period of a lot of disruption uh, for a few years, and then something will emerge from that, and the court will find another Chevron. <laughs> to, you know, because courts aren't going to make these hard decisions about policy um, uh, that are so expert driven. They're going to have to eventually defer again to agencies. But we're going to, we will have a period of a lot of disruption, I think, uh, in the lower courts as they try to sort through if we, if we, if the court ends up getting rid of Chevron deference. Tim, as Chris says, Justice Barrett got in a traditional conservative argument in favor of Chevron that it's good to get judges out of policymaking and leave that to the political branches. He and Kent Barnett have stats to support that argument. Uh, what do you think of Chris's argument that if the court overturns Chevron, there'll be more judges engaged in policymaking and less uniformity, and therefore it will be quite disruptive? Well, I don't know. That strikes me as kind of reading tea leaves. I, I don't know how to predict the future. I, I agree with, with what Professor Walker said, that, that it's, it's, I, I kind of agreed with both sides on this point, that, that you, you might see more and you might see less. But it's true that something like Chevron creates uniformity, but you could also create uniformity by shutting down the entire federal, federal judiciary, right? So suppose that we eliminated the entire judicial system overnight. Now you've got uniformity, right? Because for every plaintiff out there, the answer is no. Every single plaintiff, the answer is no. There's nothing you can do because there's no court system, right? That's uniformity. Well, if we prioritize uniformity over getting the law right, I think we are led to something that amounts to the equivalent of shutting down the courts, which are, in this situation is deference doctrines that say that you really there's nothing that you, the citizen, can possibly do when the federal government declares your perfectly dry land to be a wetland and therefore federal, subject to, to regulation of the Clean Water Act. There's nothing you can do. Sorry, sucks to be you. Now, that's uniformity. And it strikes me as that, that, that we should prioritize instead the right of citizens to challenge the legality of government action. Uh, and as for whether this will actually create a, a, a flood of litigation, I very much doubt it because there are so many other obstacles to, to litigation against federal agencies. There, you know, there are other deference doctrines that are not, be, not at issue here that will still remain in place. There's the cost and burden and expense and, and difficulty of you know, getting a lawyer and all, the, all the, the hassle of dealing with regulatory agencies. There's, the agencies have plenty of other ways to deprive you of your day in court, and they will continue to use those. So I, I'm not particularly concerned uh, about that. With regard to um, the conservative value of avoiding judicial policymaking, I think this is very much overblown in this context. I don't think that courts are prone to impose their own judicial policies in, ter in terms of statutory interpretation as much as they are uh, prone to do that, doing that in other contexts. I think it's a, a less likely here than in situations like due process and equal protection. That's, those are much more likely to, to lead to this. And again, as was mentioned earlier, if a, since these are all statutory cases, if a, if a court, if a judge goes wild and starts interpreting the statute in some policy-driven way, Congress can change the statute. There you go. Problem solved. You say it can't be done. It can be done. It, it's done all the time. Some time ago, well, this is going back a way, but uh, I remember when the federal courts declared the do not call list to be invalid, it was changed within 24 hours 
Congress got together and passed a new bill within 24 hours to overturn that court ruling. When, you know, this, this sort of thing is easy to, to do when there is actual consensus. The problem with the pro-administrative state side of this argument, the pro-regulatory side of this argument, is it typically assumes that there's consensus when there's not. And it wraps itself in the mantle of, oh, we need to make life easier for government bureaucrats. We need uniformity. We need to, to reduce judicial policymaking. Everybody agrees with it. No, not everybody agrees with that. What we need is a more dynamic legal constitutional system where people get their day in court, and Chevron takes that away from them. Chris, tell us about the evolution in conservative thinking about Chevron. One of Chevron's greatest champions was Justice Scalia, and in an influential 1989 article, Judge Scalia defended Chevron deference on the grounds that broad delegation to the executive is a hallmark of a modern administrative state, and Chevron provides a dependable background rule of law against which Congress can legislate. Justice Scalia also embraced two values, judicial deference and taking judges out of politics and having uh, legislatures rather than judges uh, make policy. Uh, fast forward to today, uh, Justice Gorsuch, uh, a leading critic of Chevron, uh, has criticized it on the grounds that it uh, defers too much and that strictly construing federal power is more consistent with the framers' intentions. How can you reconcile these two very different visions of judicial conservatism, and, and what does it say about the ambiguity about what the framers thought on the question? So at our argument, Justice Alito asked the question, like, why have conservatives fallen out of favor with Chevron? And Paul Clement gave two answers that I actually hadn't thought about before, and I'm not entirely persuaded. But one is the rise of textualism. Um, and I think what he meant by that is in the 1980s, textualism was just starting to become like a, a, a growing predominant theory. And, and today, as Justice Elena you know, Kagan has mentioned, it, it, we're all textualists now. Uh, and I think what Paul Clement meant by that is textualist judges, conservative textualist judges, have a pretty easy time finding statutes unambiguous. <laughs> Like Justice, Justice Scalia was probably the best at this. I, he, I think he only had two cases where he got to the second step of Chevron, finding a statute ambiguous. In the criminal law context, he would find words unambiguous by finding them to be terms of art. Uh, and so I think for Justice Scalia, he could say that he believes in deference um, because if it was truly ambiguous, that was a very small set of cases. And in the rest of them, he'd be able to find the right answer, the best answer, uh, the only answer, I guess, along those lines. And so that, I think that is part of it. I think that conservatives, at least some conservatives, are much more confident in textuals providing one answer uh, than, than they were back in the 80s. And therefore, Chevron encourages judges who aren't as textualists to not find statutes and unambiguous when, they, when, they, when perhaps they really are. The second one that he gave, and that was interesting, was that we are more skeptical about agency expertise today than we were in the 80s. Uh, and on that front, I don't know if that's true at all. <laughs> I mean, I think the skepticism has been there forever. And like, I, I'm not sure it gets any higher. But I will say that for me, and this gets back to what I was mentioning, kind of more my reason is like that Congress isn't legislating as much and presidents are, are pushing things through the administrative process when they, that should go through Congress, is that I think we're seeing, I mean, some more charitable reading of Paul Clement, I think we're seeing agencies say they're exercising expertise when they're actually instead just making a policy judgment or a political judgment uh, that the president wants them to implement. In other words, like expertise is used as an excuse uh, to advance certain interpretations. Uh, and so those are the two that, that, that he gave uh, in response. Uh, I think another one that Justice Kennedy gave in the last opinion he wrote for the court on the court his concurrence in Pereira versus Sessions, is that the lower courts are applying reflexive deference at times. In other words, they're not doing the hard work of figuring out whether a statute is truly unambiguous or not. Uh, they're kind of saying, oh, this is complex, this is hard. Uh, we're just going to defer to the agency and not really do the hard work of statutory interpretation. So those are kind of the three or the four stories in my mind. Maybe Tim has more. Congress not doing as much and the president kind of ramming things through. Textualism provides answers more often. Agency expertise is used as an excuse uh, for big policy changes. Uh, and that lower courts uh, don't always work as hard as they should uh, to figure out whether statutes unambiguous. 
Tim, your thoughts on the debate within conservatism about textualism. There was a famous encounter between Justice Scalia and Richard Epstein in the 1980s at the Cato Institute, where uh, Justice Scalia defended traditional deference and uh, allowing policymaking to be made in legislatures, not courts. And, and Epstein defended judicial engagement and said that courts had to resurrect uh, restrictions on the administrative state that had been dormant since the New Deal, and, and, and Scalia was appalled. Uh, tell us about this debate. You're obviously on the Epstein side of it, but um, why, how and why did conservatives switch to the more libertarian and less deferential position? And what does that say about what the framers thought on this Yeah, question? and in fact, there was a, it kind of bookends with a debate, I think it was three years ago now at the National Federal Society Convention. I wasn't there, but I, I think it was Randy Barnett versus, I think it was Judge J. Harvey Wilkinson, I think, over deference. And what was remarkable about that was that after that debate, when the audience was asked to applaud for which side they supported, they were more on the anti-deference side. And I, I think it shows an evolution of thought within, broadly termed, the conservative or libertarian legal world over the past 40 years or so. Justice Scalia was, you know, he was of this generation of the Bork generation that was very much, you know, Bork's, Bork's intellectual godfather was Oliver Wendell Holmes. It, very pro-deference, very anti-natural rights and I think that has largely given way now to the world of Justice Thomas, who is much more sympathetic to the idea of an active judiciary that uh, active in the sense of, in, of enforcing the Constitution instead of ignoring it, um, of enforcing natural rights as, as protected by the, the, the 14th Amendment and, and, and taking these, these constitutional issues series that are seriously that our framers intended them to take. So as far as Scalia himself is concerned, I, I can't obviously pretend to speak for him. I only, I only met him two or three times, but uh, his he it seems to me from his work, there was always this sort of tension in his mind. Uh, he was definitely not 100% on the Bork side as far as judicial deference is concerned. He was he took certain individual rights very seriously. You know, he's he, especially the things like search and seizure. He wrote some great opinions on that that show that he he was not willing to just close his eyes to some things. But at the uh, at the same time, he was also very hostile to what he viewed as judicial policymaking or legislating from the bench. And I think those two things were always in tension in his jurisprudence. And that that tension is revealed by the the, the change in attitudes over. Uh, Chevron deference. Chris, the liberal case against uh, this new textualism is that it's the old Lochner natural rights approach in a new guise. And by trying to resurrect doctrines that have been dormant since before the New Deal, like the non-delegation doctrine and the major questions doctrine, uh, the court is just doing an all-out assault on the administrative estate and making it impossible to uh, regulate, and you combine that with overturning Chevron, and it's basically uh, a, a, a textualism uh, which is un unrooted in original understanding and is just anti-regulatory. Uh, your response? Yeah, I, I think that the you know, it, it is somewhat surprising, and, and, and Kent and I in our amicus brief in the last part kind of walked through this. The you know the problems that people raise about Chevron. Um, I thought would die after the major questions doctrine was kind of recognized the last couple of terms as a real force to constrain agency actions. Uh, and, and, and because the way the court has approached Chevron and adding in the major questions doctrine, it, 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 it basically leaves, it, I think it addresses all the problems that Tim mentioned earlier uh, about agencies making major value judgments that Congress should make. Um, step one has been reinvigorated, so it really, really matters. So you have to really make sure that the statute's ambiguous. In other words, what a court is doing when it decides the statute is ambiguous is they're saying the law has run out. Uh, and if the law has run out, we assume Congress wanted the agency to fill in the holes. And then at step two of Chevron, Justice Kagan and others have, have encouraged courts to make sure that agencies don't act in an arbitrary, capricious manner. When they say that agencies have to act reasonable, that means they use the procedures that are required, that they consider counter arguments that they justify when they change their positions. 
uh, that they look at reliance interests or some of the things. And so we live in a world now where what is Chevron left to do? Chevron means for minor implementation details in a statute, we're going to defer to the agency who has expertise uh, and who is supervised by a political appointee uh, of the president. Uh, and in my mind, that that is the world that I that we want to live in, <laughs> uh, where, where, where we do, you know, have the agencies, you know, flesh out those minor details. Uh, and so I, so I think this is part of a larger legal conservative movement, uh, at least a libertarian version of it, <laughs> of trying to kind of deconstruct the administrative state. Uh, but most of that was already, you know, administrative state was more reined in with the major questions doctrine. And in some ways, like, this is addressing the problem that in my mind, just doesn't really exist anymore. Um, uh, and it's fun that that last part of our brief is actually just, uh, we might even be plagiarizing. I don't know. We have to run it through the software. Paul Clement's position two years ago for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, where he says Chevron is constitutionally inspired out of separation of powers, but we have to have some guardrails on it. And here are the guardrails. And uh, and and if we have those guardrails, we're in a good world. <laughs> so I just think it's interesting now that those guardrails two years ago um, aren't good enough anymore uh, for the legal conservative movement. Tim, your account of why the libertarian assault on the administrative state uh, with the goal of resurrecting the major questions doctrine and the non-delegation doctrine combined with overturning Chevron is a good thing. Is it right that this was the major goal of the movement, and it's now coming to fruition? I think it's certainly one of the one of the missions of anybody who takes individual rights seriously and is concerned about the overreaching of of government officials who are insulated from from accountability to the voters. I do think that you know what, what we're just talking about this the the degree to which the major question doctrine had resolved all of this stuff a few years ago that issue came up at some length in the oral argument in in these cases and and I think Justice Gorsuch particularly when 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 the Solicitor General said well all you have to do is make clear you know that that the the Chevron is for the minor details his response was again in a rather emphatic tone, because he th he seems to have thought that we did do that. We already made clear that Chevron is only for minor details, and the, and major questions doctrine addresses these issues. And yet here we he said in the in the argument here we are with a case where the court went ahead and used Chevron that, to say that this agency can impose these really quite dramatic costs on this small business. And under the under a statute that gives the agency power to quote prescribe such other measures or conditions or requirements as are determined to be necessary and appropriate end quote so that it, that shows that the major question issue was not sufficient to address these questions so so the court has to take has to take action about Chevron because obviously the lower courts haven't gotten the message and they've been given that message time and time again. Well, it's time for closing thoughts in this excellent discussion, uh, which has been wide ranging and. Illuminating, Chris, first to you, tell We the People listeners why you think Chevron should be upheld. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that Tim mentions this particular case because, you know, the Chief Justice at our argument asked Paul Clement, he's like, it sounds like you're arguing that you should win under Chevron. Yeah. <laughs> and I think he's entirely right. I mean, this is an easy step one case. Um, agency was not given the power to impose these monitors on these fishing boats uh, by Congress, and that Congress gave the power to impose monitors in other contexts. That's like classic textualism. You, if they give it to you one place and don't give it to you somewhere else, they didn't give it to you. Um, and I think that gets to the larger question. When we think about the debate about Chevron, it's a debate about administrative law more generally. Um, you know, administrative law is trying to strike the right balance of empowering agencies to fulfill their statutory duties in a reasonable, thoughtful manner and combating against agencies overreaching and acting in arbitrary and capricious uh, manners. Uh, and, and Chevron, especially with the major questions doctrine and the way that two steps are playing out before the court today, strikes that right balance um, uh, of trying to encourage agencies to, to implement statutes, to fulfill their statutory mandates that Congress and the presidents gave them when the statute was enacted. 
Uh, and in a world without Chevron, the folks who are going to make that decision are district judges issuing nationwide injunctions in Texas or Hawaii. Uh, and that's just not the way to run a federal government. Um, uh, and if you don't buy me on that, you can probably hopefully tell I'm an old school judicial conservative. You know, I, I think courts should move slowly and restrained and should try to get politics out of what they do. And that really the political branches should make the ma major value judgments in our society. Um, but ultimately, if, if you don't buy that, I'd say at least think about stare decisis here. Uh, this question is in Congress's court, not the Supreme Court. If they want to get rid of Chevron, they can. They have in the past in certain contexts. Um, and if they don't, that's a really strong signal about what we, the people, uh, want for our form of federal government. Uh, and the Supreme Court really doesn't have any business uh, in interfering with that. Tim, last word in this great discussion is to you. Final thoughts for we, the people listeners, on why you think Chevron should be overturned. This is a legal doctrine that is not found in the Constitution or in the writings of the framers about agencies that are not found in the Constitution or in the writings of the framers that are given powers that are, do not exist in the Constitution or in the writing of the framers. And we, the people, are uh, supposed to be governed by the Constitution, not by judicially made doctrines that maximize the power of unaccountable bureaucrats over whom you have really no control and yet who have effectively both the executive, judicial, and legislative power to control your life. And in fact, you know, we were all raised under the whole uh, how a bill becomes a law kind of theory that Congress passes something, the president signs it, then it's a law. The reality is that virtually none of the laws nowadays, actually, that, and by laws I mean the rules that govern your life, virtually none of those are actually adopted that way. Almost all of the laws that, uh, uh, that control our day-to-day -day actions are actually just rules that are created by these agencies uh, because they're given power to do what they see, think is, is right. And, and I, th I think instead what we ought to have is a constitutional order that's actually governed by the language of the Constitution, the primary purpose of which is to preserve the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Thank you so much, uh, Christopher Walker and uh, Tim Sandiford, for a deep, wide-ranging, and great discussion about the future of Chevron. Chris, Tim, thank you so much for joining Thank you, Jeff. Thanks. Today's episode was produced by Lana Ulrich, Bill Pollack, and Samson Mastashari. It was engineered by Bill Pollack. Research was provided by Samson Mastashari, Cooper Smith, and Yara Durese. I'm thrilled to share that on February 13th, I'm releasing my new book, The Pursuit of Happiness, How Classical Writers on Virtue Inspire the Lives of the Founders and Defined America. I can't wait to share the book with We the People listeners. And if you get the book, email me at jrosen at constitutioncenter.org if you'd like a book play for The Pursuit of Happiness. Please recommend the show to friends, colleagues, or anyone anywhere who is eager for a weekly dose of constitutional illumination and debate. Sign up for the newsletter at constitutioncenter.org forward slash connect. Always remember that the National Constitution Center is a private nonprofit. We rely on the generosity of people across the country who are inspired by our nonpartisan mission of constitutional education and debate, support the mission, or give a donation of any amount, $5, $10 or more, at constitutioncenter.org forward slash donate. On behalf of the National Constitution Center, I'm Jeffrey Rosen.